great to be uh, invited back again this year. I don't know why she keeps doing it, but she does, I guess, till I start getting bad reviews. Uh, anyway, um, last year we had Snowpocalypse and the Super Bowl, and I'm not going to do any comedy acts about that. But anyway, I'm from the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services. I'm the regional chief medical officer for not only our Atlanta region, but also Boston. We've just had a reorganization. We are now one CMS in many locations, so I actually report right up to the National Chief Medical Officer, and we're, we're doing a lot more integration uh, across the country. So we just don't have headquarters in the regions. We have everybody is one CMS, although we may be in different locations. So anyway, uh, I feel in many ways that I, I'm just a warm-up act here, because all the rock stars are coming after me. I mean, you're going to have great people, great speakers. No, Gina didn't ask me to give you a, uh, an advertisement, but I looked at the program. Uh, you're going to have the Deputy Secretary of Health and Human Services, who's going to talk to you about all the uh, uh, issues that Health and Human Services are doing writ large in, in, uh, in, in improving health care. A lot more forward thinking uh, and forward uh, uh, looking uh, talk than what I'm going to do. I'm going to give you the here and now, where we've been and where we are, and you'll hear from the Deputy HHS Secretary tomorrow as to where we're going. You'll also hear from his Chief of Staff in uh, talking about uh, 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 interoperability. So there are some things I'm not going to cover, and then I know, as I talked about rock stars, they're you, and, and you're doing this. And a lot of the speakers are doing this. So the best is yet to come. I'm just the warm-up act here. I'm going to violate Dr. Banerjee's rule of presentations, though. I, I, I do like to have dialogue, but I've got a lot of ground to cover. So I'm going to ask you to hold questions until I finish, because I really do want to kind of give you the large waterfront. And, uh, and then we'll leave time for uh, some questions. Uh, at the end, so sorry, I'm going to violate your, your uh, preferred method of speaker's interaction. So anyway, uh, don't worry about this uh, disclaimer. It just says, I'm from the government. I'm here to help you. And uh, <laughs> that always gets a laugh, but I'm sincere. You know, that's a sincere statement. We really are here to help you. Uh, but it, it is good for a laugh line. Uh, and, and, and of course, the slides I'm, I'm giving you, a couple of them, if you're really close, you'll notice maybe a couple of years out of date if you really pay attention. Hopefully you won't notice those, but they illustrate uh, my, my larger point. And, and of course, that brings me to the point that with CMS, things are changing every day. I can't keep up with everything We're, that's coming out of the pipeline. I, I, I mean, I have to focus on certain areas, but you all know what your areas are, and, and I'll give you a little hint. Um, we have a pretty robust website. Some of the uh, web pages are more robust than others. Some of the URLs, most of the URLs are impossible to remember. So I just suggest, without naming any, any particular search engine, you go to your favorite search engine, you put in the key term you want, put CMS after it, you will probably, within the first five hits, get the CMS web page of the topic you want, whether it's Innovation Center, whether it's ACOs, shared savings, CMS, just put CMS at the end, it'll come right up. Uh, that's a better search engine than trying to go to our main page or for me to give you URLs that go on for, God, it would take a half a slide. So that's, that's my little hint there because I do mention that there are references. And I do have some references, but your best references, you know how to figure it out, I'm sure. Anyway. CMS goes without saying, although we are a uh, division of the, uh, an agency of Health and Human Services, our job is to pay for, buy, and uh, assure quality in healthcare in this country, and as such, we're the largest purchaser of healthcare in the world. And, and, and right now, uh, with uh, today, we pay approximately one-third of national health expenditures, Medicare, Medicaid, Children's Health, and that's not counting Affordable Care Act um, uh, programs as well. So we essentially cover roughly one in three of every Americans already. I tell people that, you know, we're, we're the world's largest insurance company. 
I'm actually the chief medical officer for the largest region and the largest health insurance company in the world. I'm also one of the lowest paid doctors I know because I work for the government, which means you own my company. You own our company. And, and you are the stockholders and you are the beneficiaries. And of course, don't even ask me where we're going uh, in terms of policy. That's for the deputy secretary to answer because we have an interesting board of trustees. There are 535 members of our board of trustees. Did you know that? It's a big board. 100 of them are in the U.S. Senate, 435 are in the House of Representatives. And you get to vote for about three of those people. And that's how our company gets their direction. And if that doesn't make it interesting enough, then we have our executives, our, our, our head leadership is appointed by the president. Our administrator is appointed by the president. Our top level of political appointees and the secretary's office, et cetera and they're appointed by the president. So now you know exactly how, how this organization runs and how it all makes sense. Let's just say our business plan is not always coherent, but we do what our board of trustees and our leadership ask us to do. And I'm not political, I'm a career civil servant. So that'll give you an idea of, of, of a little bit about my insurance company. Uh, so now let's talk about chronic conditions, and, and this is really why you're all here, to coordinate care for people with chronic conditions. And I apologize for the lighting here. Uh, I could not change the background of these slides, but let me just show you that the purple here, purple is the color you want to remember. 15% of all people with Medicare, fee for service, this is not Medicare Advantage, have six or more chronic conditions, 15%. Those 15% are responsible for 51% of uh, Medicare spending. Okay, and we have, uh, I don't think this has been updated, but this gives you, it, it, this isn't changing overnight. People that have one chronic condition, those healthy, generally healthy 65-year-olds uh, that, that come in, 34%, uh, they only ha account for 7% of our Medicare spending. So this is the Pareto principle, the 80-20 rule on steroids. And if that's not enough, let's look at readmissions. And uh, once again, this is the 15% of patients that have six or more chronic conditions. They account for 70, I want to say 77%, I can't read that uh, the way it is on the screen, around 77% of all our readmissions. So if you want to target readmissions reduction, target those 15% of patients that have the six or more chronic conditions. Uh, and these 34% that have zero to one chronic conditions account for 1% of readmissions. And then you can see the various increments, two to three uh, chronic conditions only account for 6% of readmissions. 21% account for 15. So once again, here's, here's the big picture. Now this next slide is the same color scheme uh, and it looks kind of busy and I hope it doesn't make it dizzy, but I want to start at the bottom here. Down at the bottom here, what the, this, this one condition is the blue, five or more, it seems we changed the number here, is, is purple, the green and their intermediate, one to two, three to four other chronic conditions. Very few people, 1% of people that have heart failure. And by the way, I think these slides are on your, your drive. Uh, right, Gina? I've, we've, I've asked that they be posted for 60 days, and after 60 days, they need to be taken down on the website, so uh, refer to them, because we don't keep stuff up for more than 60 days because it gets out of date so fast. If you have, oh, sorry. If you have heart failure, only 1% of people have uh, heart failure as their only diagnosis. Heart failure patients have uh, I'm, I'm doing the math in my head. 65% uh, of patients with heart failure have uh, 
five or more chronic conditions. So if you have heart, heart failure, you got a lot of problems besides heart failure. And what are they probably? You probably got atrial fib, you probably got stroke, you got COPD, asthma, ischemic heart disease. These, you know, these are the big five and six as we go up the line, heart failure, stroke. And, and you can see diabetes, maybe 4% have only one condition. Uh, even there, they have 35% have five or more uh, chronic conditions. The interesting part up, up on the top here, autism, HIV, AIDS, and schizophrenia, these tend to represent um, younger populations uh, that have, uh, are eligible for Medicare based on uh, disability, so they're not your 65 and older, although our HIV uh, population is growing every year. Uh, but autism, schizophrenia, et cetera. But you can see otherwise, these are all the big ones you'd think, hypertension, Alzheimer's, diabetes, et cetera. That gives you an idea of how, how these chronic conditions all interact and, and why it's so important to focus. If we can just focus on those multi-problem patients, the, what we would call as a doctor, I'm an ER doc, the, I'm gonna say this, no offense, man, but as the, the, the train wrecks, the ones that have so many things going on that it's like, where do we start? Where do we start? Do we start with the heart failure? Do we start with the diabetes? Do we start with this, the atrial fib? Where do we start? But if we focus on coordinating care for those patients, those multi-problem patients, um, that's where we can save a lot of money. The other thing my company is unique about is we're not trying to make money. We're just trying to break even and not break the U.S. budget, which we are on a trajectory to do if we don't do something. So this, this is where we're going to save this is where we're gonna save the money, is, is in care coordination. And, and give better care and better quality. Okay, so we have an entire page here, and this is one of the easier URLs, uh, GoCMS slash CCM, Chronic Care Management. Many of you been to this page? Raise your hand. Okay, quite a few. And you know it's a pretty robust uh, page. It's got information for professionals et cetera, our partnerships, and, and all sorts of uh, information for patients as well. Um, and um, we're pushing chronic care management. We're trying to get physicians and hospitals and healthcare practices not to leave money on the table because we're paying them extra to coordinate care. And we'd like them to take, take that extra money. And we think it's going to pay dividends and give us a good return on investment. So, uh, what's new in chronic care management for this year? I'm going to start at the min uh, in the beginning, in the middle here. We have created another extra Medicare code for additional time spent be beyond the initial 20 minutes of non-complex chronic care. So that's an extra payment uh, code that's available now. And of course, we have the complex chronic care, and we have uh, all the other uh, uh, complex uh, care codes as well. We also are uh, increasing payment for transitional care management. You know, the, uh, the chronic care management is a monthly fee paid to practices to manage patients' care. Uh, it doesn't have to have a face-to-face -face visit with a physician every time. Transitional payment, as you know, is for care management uh, after discharge from the inpatient stay. Uh, and then we are also recognized that, especially in internal medicine, a lot of internal medicine subspecialists, cardiologists, uh, endocrinologists, et cetera, do primary care. So it's not just family physicians and primary care uh, internists, but uh, a lot of other physicians uh, do primary care, and we're creating what we call a principal care management code. Principal care management with only a single serious high-risk chronic condition. Those are those patients in blue. So. Once again, you have somebody that has isolated diabetes and no other complications yet, such as heart failure or heart disease and whatnot, then that code is, is there to help prevent, uh, prevent those complications. And then finally, we are, in our physician fee schedule, we are increasing payments this year for primary care services. We are increasing the weights of uh, all our uh, office-based face, uh, visits. So we're increasing payment for primary care uh, providers as well. Uh, so what are the questions uh, that, that we want to run on here? What are the aims that put us 
on a glide path to solve the biggest health problems in our communities. Obviously, we need to create systems. We have to look at systems. We can't look at simply isolated practices. We have to organize those systems and get those systems to generate the results. And what are those infrastructure requirements necessary so we can have collaborative quality improvement and, and learning mechanisms? And I know many of you, probably most of you, are from larger systems. You're probably already doing this, I would expect. And what are the better models to coordinate care? Well, we're still working on those, obviously. And of course, you, you know, we're, we, we've introduced alternative payment models, we've introduced ACOs, uh, et cetera, et cetera, pioneer ACOs, and the list goes on with our demonstrations. And then how do we best involve all of that in building a learning health system so we can learn from each other, teach one, share information, apply best practices, uh, and, uh, and because the answer's in the room here, the answer's not at CMS. We can, uh, we can develop metrics, we can develop pet, uh, parameters and payment mechanisms, but it's up to you to all uh, make that uh, where the rubber hits the road. So, our HHS department-wide strategy, I'm sure you'll hear this from the Deputy Secretary tomorrow, a healthcare system that rewards uh, results in accessibility, quality, innovation, empowerment of the patient. We at CMS are all about improving the healthcare delivery system but at the same time doing our utmost best to reduce administrative burden, reporting burden on those of you in the front line so you're not totally bombarded with quality metrics and spend more time behind a computer than you are taking care of patients. And our goal is to get you away from the computer and spend more time talking to the patient, looking at the patient, touching and feeling the patient, and not sitting at, uh, behind a computer screen. Uh, and uh, our, our strategy is to put, put patients first. You've already heard about this with Dr. Banerjee. Empower patients and clinicians to make decisions about their health care. Really, you know, do a patient-centered, patient-focused um, um, uh, interaction. We'll talk more about that towards the end. Uh, the administration is very uh, intent on focusing a lot of new state flexibility and local leadership that the states are the engines of innovation, and uh, then it's supporting our innovative approaches to improving quality and improving the CMS customer experience. Customers, that means everybody. That means the beneficiaries, our patients, physicians, nurses, providers, healthcare institutions, you're our customers. We want to be uh, more user-friendly to all of you. Because af after all, you own the company. And grandma and grandpa and me are already Medicare beneficiaries. And you will be too, if we can keep this company going <laughs> till you get old like me <laughs> and have your Medicare card. So anyway, uh, the four M's of older healthcare, what matters? You know, what, what is it that matters to an individual patient? Uh, my uh, father-in-law is 91 years old. My wife's a doctor. And you know, it's like I keep, my wife has a medical model sometimes of managing doc, her, her dad. She's an internist. And I say, man, what does your father really want to do? Listen, listen to your dad. Here I am, the son-in-law. Listen to your dad. Keep him away from all those doctors. He's got some of the most fragmented care I've ever seen. It's like, man, will you stop having him see all these individual doctors? Because <laughs> complications arise. Uh, and focus on what's important. Uh, to, to most people, that's going to be their frame of mind. Are they depressed? Uh, dementia? Demiri uh, delirium? Focus on uh, what these, the big things in life, not all their little diagnoses. Focus on mobility and, and, and preserving their ability to function and, and be mobile. Get in and out of bed and, and be able to walk and, and, and be independent. And then finally, of course, medications because medications uh, have their benefits, but they also have a lot of complications. So we need to optimize their use, hit that sweet spot, just the right amount, you know, just like the um, uh, making the porridge and um, Goldilocks, and, and, and uh, not too many meds, not too few to optimize and reduce uh, those, those medications that affect mobility, mentation, and what matters to the patient. 
And now, as you know, in Medicare, we've got all sorts of product lines of services, chronic care management, the wellness visit, cognitive impairment assessments, advanced care planning, we could go on behavioral health, all the way down to uh, uh, telehealth and uh, our long-term care and uh, nurse, skilled nursing and Medicaid, the same thing. And once again, I've already talked about patients over paperwork, but once again, uh, we are committed to reducing that and focusing on the patient, getting out obstacles that get in the way of the time the clinicians spend with their patients, and reduce burdens for clinicians in medical records and coding and electronic health records. And we've also, with our new physician fee schedule, come out uh, with uh, new coding for uh, office-based visits. And physicians can now, they don't have to just check the box. You know, one of this, one of this, one HPI, one review of systems, how many review of systems. You only have to document what's clinically pertinent and your level of payment. This will go into effect in 2021. The American Medical Association has just restructured the uh, CPT coding system and we have uh, endorsed that new model to simplify coding. And that means that physicians will document if, if a history and physical is pertinent, then of course you have to uh, enter that. But if a review of systems is not pertinent, then you don't have to check all those boxes. You can either uh, provide your level of care. There are five levels for established patients and four levels for new patients. The levels of care will be based on either the time spent with you pa the patient or the complexity of the medical decision making. And I'm sorry for this group over here. If you're seeing my back, if I'm, if I'm in the way, please just tell me to move. Um, I try to move around a little, but I tend to gravitate where I can see. Uh, and. Uh, and we're also EHR, it's the same thing. We're, um, we're, uh, we're, we're applying those principles into our uh, documentation in electronic health records as well. So as an example, if a clinician, whether it's a physician, nurse practitioner, physician assistant, et cetera, um, has done a history and physical and someone else has just done a history and physical or Let's say I'm a teaching physician at a medical school and I have a resident and an intern and, 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 and a medical student have all done histories and physicals. I no longer have to write my own. I can go to theirs and I can annotate my name, date that I agree or disagree with what those findings are, which should be huge in, in reducing burden on physicians and nurse practitioners. So you can be able to, within the parameters of your EHR, annotate that you agree with the prior history and physical, nothing's changed, obviously. You know, there are gonna be some reasonable time parameters if it's five years ago and you say nothing's changed. It's like, really? You know, did you really talk with the patient? But, you know, within, within medical reason, you'll be able to do that. So a lot less box checking. Uh, that should get people out behind the computers. And we're evaluating our regulations every day, every step to see what are other areas we can reduce reporting burden, both for quality measures and documentation. In fact, we've been doing what we call journey mapping, if you're used to human engineering, and I know Dr. Banerjee in industrial engineering probably very familiar with journey mapping and, and mapping out the processes of care and, and, and looking at the burdens. So for uh, uh, a clinician, uh, my light's dying here. Patient enters a clinician's practice and the first thing you have to do is check enrollment and eligibility and the beneficiary eligibility. Then you deliver to the healthcare. Then you uh, uh, do the billing and the quality reporting and the, then you get a claims denial and rejection and everything else, oversight and compliance and then our racks come in and look at you or the inspector general or whatever. Uh, and then you get a reconciliation and appeal. Well, obviously we hope those, those steps don't happen too often, but everywhere along the line we are mapping this journey and looking to see how we can get rid of unnecessary burden in each of those steps. And we're doing that not just in the clinician's office, but hospitals, nursing homes, every site of care. So that's, that's um, you know, now we're not gonna just totally rip up all the regulations there are but we are looking to, to make sure that we go through and say, do we really need to make uh, clinicians do this? 
uh, or is this really adding to patient care and quality and coordination of care? So that's what we're doing. We also have our meaningful measures where we're looking at quality measures. And we, I remember back in 2007 when our physician, uh, physician uh, reporting system, quality reporting system came out. Okay, you get me nervous when you're walking down fast. And uh, our physician reporting, I think she's gonna give me the hook. And uh, our physician reporting system came out. We had 72 measures, uh, quality reporting. And I knew the definitions and all the parameters of all those 72, excuse me, 73 quality measures. Well, now we have hundreds, hundreds of measures in different measures in different sites and uh, service and hospitals and nursing homes and physician's office and whatnot. So we're looking to consolidate that. We're looking at uh, reducing the data burden and the cost to clinicians. We're looking to align those measures across those uh, venues so that we select those quality measures that are most important and what's meaningful uh, for patients to improve patient outcome. So we are, you'll, you'll notice in our regulations sometimes that we discontinued the following 10 measures and uh, that we don't feel they're, they're reflecting uh, uh, either the standard of practice anymore or they're unnecessary or they are topped out. They're not helping us uh, uh, have uh, clinicians use those measures to improve quality of care. Okay, uh-oh, this must be, I stole some of slides. This must be animation time. I hate it when this happens. Steal somebody's slides and then you realize there's animation. Let's see. Oh yeah, animation, here we go. Bang, 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 bang. Okay, so some of the domain areas that we have promote effective communication and coordination of care, promote effective prevention and treatment of chronic disease, you know, diabetes, uh, diabetes prevention, et cetera, uh, our management of chronic conditions we've talked about, working with the communities to uh, promote community engagement. Of course, making care affordable. We have to do that. Making care safer by uh, reducing harm, such as healthcare-associated infections, preventable healthcare harm, and uh, strengthening the person and family engagement as partners in their care. Those are our uh, domain areas that we're looking at under our meaningful measures. And just, uh, just as an example, is there, uh, yeah, yeah, we did have animation. Uh, so meaningful uh, medication uh, areas here in uh, communication and coordination, medication management. Use of high risk medicines in the elderly. There are certain medicines that are rather high risk and physicians should think twice before prescribing those. Uh, admissions and readmissions to hospitals, obviously. Uh, uh, interoperability of health information. And of course, uh, uh, Deputy Secretary Hardin's, Hargan's uh, Chief of Staff is gonna talk a lot more about interoperability tomorrow from the HHS point of view. And as you can see again, these, these measure areas are being used across our uh, payment models, our quality payment systems, our shared savings, ACOs, um, the marketplace even uh, under the Affordable Care Act, SNFs, long-term care, Medicaid, et cetera. Same thing with strengthen person and family engagement as partners of care, care plans, hospice visits when the death is imminent, um, uh, functional status, so assessment for on their total hip replacement, uh, looking at patients' functional status uh, as well. All of these are the uh, person and family engagement type of measures. I'm not gonna go through all of them. And then of course, once again, you can see, as I've said, we're reporting Quality measures, all of our programs now uh, report quality measures. Not just physician quality reporting, but uh, inpatient, uh, outpatient quality, cancer uh, hospitals, uh, psychiatric facilities, physician side, physician compare, physician quality payment program, uh, um, post ambulatory care settings, uh, long term care uh, hospitals. The payment model reporting in the Medicare shared savings, uh, ACOs, hospital value-based purchasing, population quality to Medicaid uh, quality reporting, Medicare Part C and Medicare Part D. That's Medicare, Part C is Medicare Advantage. And of course, by definition, Medicare Advantage is already on a population health model, but we, we pay our uh, Medicare Advantage plans based on their quality as well. Their payment is modified. So, 
that just gives you an idea. And then, then a lot of what we're doing is um, under our Partnership for Patients program is to start these large scale educational networks that where you get to interact the hospital innovation and improvement networks, the HINs under our Partnership for Patients that involves 4,000 hospitals. Our quality improvement networks run by our uh, quality improvement uh, organizations that are in communities and nursing homes and home health and hospice pharmacies even, uh, and our transforming clinical practice that just wrapped up with over 100,000 clinicians uh, learning to uh, improve and uh, better coordinate and uh, make their uh, care uh, more valuable. And, and then MACRA and MIPS and the quality payment program as well. And we're focusing on those underserved uh, rural support hospitals. I mean, pick out a name, you'll hear from someone later, Geisinger, and some of the big health, uh, health plans and that. Well, they, they know how to do this, but we're focusing on uh, those smaller practices, those solo practices, those practices in the rural areas that have 15 or fewer uh, physicians, nurse practitioners, et cetera. Those are the people we're focusing on to get them up to speed where they can even form virtual networks. Uh, because the big facilities, the Mayos of the world, the Geisingers of the world, uh, they're doing this already. The Emory Clinics, they've got, uh, they've got staff to do this, so the doctors don't have to worry, but those smaller practices really do. Uh, uh, this is, doesn't show up very well, but our hospital improvement innovation networks, um, when you look at it, you'll see that uh, uh, you can see in some areas the darker shading. We have over 81% of all hospitals in the state participating. And even in the middle here, we have uh, you know, 40, 61 to 80, 40 to 60 in certain states. So most hospitals are participating in our uh, hospital innovation networks. I assume your system is participating, Dr. Banerjee, for instance. And our QIO networks, the same thing, the improvement organizations they're doing. We're doing such things as working to reduce adverse drug, drug events in every state. Those, those once again, those, those high-risk medications, those chronic medications like anticoagulants, looking very carefully at reducing opioid use in, in the elderly, although at the same time, not rapidly taping tapering grandma off an opioid if grandma and grandpa have been on an opioid for 10 years. Just don't go there. Just leave them alone. So we're getting that message out to physicians too that it's not a knee-jerk reaction that everybody gets tapered. No. Where the money is is just don't start it in the first place. And I had an example in my own family. My wife was a physician, had some minor soft tissue surgery several years ago at a big university hospital in the Atlanta area where she's on the faculty. And she walks out the, the door and the, the, the resident, surgery resident had written a prescription and we're just good doobies and we go down to the pharmacy and we fill the prescriptions and I look at this bottle I go, man, the resident wrote you for 30 days of Norco. <laughs> what are they thinking? I said, I've got, now I've, we just bought a bottle of 30 days of a, a Schedule II narcotic, and it's gonna stay in our bathroom till you take one or two. She took one max. She said, I don't need this, I don't like it. And then I had to find, you know, put, find the old dirty cat litter and, and, and put the narco in the dirty cat litter. That's how the, the cheap and quick way to, if people really wanna go through, through dirty cat litter and the, uh, in the, uh, in the landfill, I'm sorry, but that's very sad. But uh, that's, and, and you know, that was an example in my, own, in my own family. And we happened to talk to her surgeon, we saw him at the dinner one night and, and at a restaurant, he said, hey, by the way, once the opioid, you know what your resident did? He wrote for 30 days of a narcotic for my wife. Really? You know, it's like, yeah, we're, we're working on it. The average, average uh, max is generally around eight days post-surgery. And some surgeries have even fewer. It depends on the type of surgery. So the, the thing is, let's not start. Let's not use opioids as the, um, as the knee-jerk response to the fall to begin with. Let's build up and see what we can do um, 
and, and stop this problem. And so that's my little sermon. I'm, I'm sorry, but same thing with anticoagulates, anticoagulants. People can, can really suffer consequences with those too. So that, that's just an idea of some of the things we're doing here on the quality side and hospital value-based uh, programs. This was the domains for uh, last year. Safety is right up there. Clinical care, efficiency and cost reduction, and person and community engagement. These are the four domains. Uh, he's, these are the weights and each, these are the measures in each of those domains, but these are the four domain families you see. And then we have improved patient safety over the last, this five year snapshot, 25% reduction in overall harm. That would equate to around 125,000 lives saved. You probably all know, and this is no secret, I'm a physician, I have a license to say this, the fourth leading cause of death in the United States is Pardon me? Meritical errors. That is correct. Doctors will argue with me. I'm sorry. It is the fourth leading cause of death. And a lot of those are preventable. So, um, and, and, and the savings is astronomical and people's quality of life is better. Four million, three million fewer harms over five years. Antibiotic stewardship, another thing. Uh, and we work very closely with the Centers for Disease Control. I'm on some panels. We were actually, one day, we were looking, we were talking about looking at heat maps based on zip codes where antibiotics are overprescribed. And then another conference, I still have a memory, we're looking at opioid heat maps where opioids were overprescribed. And lo and behold, I said, hey, did anybody notice that where it's all dark and red up in, the, up in Appalachia? West Virginia, Kentucky, Tennessee, I read, did anybody notice that both antibiotics and opioids are being overprescribed in the same place? I don't know how that works. I have to say there's some, I'm just gonna say some lousy doctors doing that, okay? Because it's harder to say no than it is to write a prescription. I'm an ER doc, I know that. It takes me longer to say no, you don't need the antibiotic and no, you don't need uh, the, uh, the narcotic, but some docs, we could see it. It's like, oh, here's your unnecessary antibiotic for your cold, and would you like some OxyContin with that too? I mean, really, this is what we're dealing with. I'm not making this stuff up. The one thing that's interesting about my job is I see the best of healthcare in a lot of places, and I see stuff that makes my head want to just explode, saying, how did, these, how did we let these people into the profession that I thought was an honorable profession, and why are we letting them stay? That's a separate issue. But anyway, I digress. So I tell you, I gotta, I gotta be careful because I lose my filter here as I go on, and um, uh, I try to hopefully give you some color commentary here, but you, I think you know what I'm talking about, and we're trying to address that. Uh, so what are we doing? Uh, we're moving from the historical state that you heard about, Dr. Banerjee, which was uh, producer-centered uh, volume, uh, volume incentives, uh, incentives. It was fragmented care, it was unsustainable from both a quality and a financial point of view. And we're moving over to the patient-centered, uh, outcome-driven, market-driven, and coordinated care models. And we're pretty much way across this uh, uh, pathway now. Here's where we started your traditional fee-for-service, no link to value, that's essentially a dinosaur. That category does not really exist anymore. I, there are very few, if any, uh, payment models that don't have some modifiers based on quality. And then fee-for-service linked to quality, this is where physicians are if they're not in an ACO uh, right now or um, uh, a Medicare Advantage plan, but they're getting fee-for-service. and. Uh, uh, they are, have uh, the physician value modifier and the uh, quality payment program. And then where we are right now is pretty much right in the middle here, category three, and moving towards category four population-based payments. Uh, and uh, pioneer accountable care organizations in years three and four are population-based, et cetera. Uh, accountable care organizations here are in category three but moving very quickly all the way towards here, bundled payments, et cetera, going from 
shared savings where they were, you were just sharing the savings, the upside, to in order to get the savings shared, you also have to share in the downside risk. So you have to be at full, full risk, a two-tailed type shared savings model, and we're moving there very rapidly. Um, our innovation center is where most of these models come out. Over 18 million beneficiaries are currently touched and growing uh, through innovation uh, models. Uh, well over 200,000 providers are participating uh, in these models and growing every day. This slide's a little dated. It shows you where the metropolitan areas are. This is back in 2016. Uh, where the, the major metropolitan areas where ACO assigned beneficiaries were. You can see they're in the metropolitan areas, but even that is growing uh, into the uh, uh, rural areas. And we have not only plain vanilla ACOs, shared savings, we have pioneer ACOs that are more aggressive on uh, incorporating risk. Uh, next generation ACOs, once again, you can get detailed uh, um, uh, descriptions of all of these if you just go to innovation at cms.gov or put that in your uh, search engine. And uh, shared savings, as I said, that we started out with the upside risk and now we're moving to both upside and downside risk if you want to participate. And we did uh, uh, have a final rule. I think that that's a misprint that should have, the final rule was uh, December 2000. 18 for 2019 performance year. That's a typo. But so now we're accelerating. If you want to participate in our ACOs, you can't just stay. We're just going to share the upside without the downside. You got to keep progressing and you got to make a long term commitment over five years to say we're going to move along and make this commitment to share the risk uh, and not just the upside. Um, and we have more streamlined participation options for those ACOs. And here's all the uh, brags and the press releases on the pathways to success uh, for the shared savings program if you're interested. And once again, they'll be on your, um, your uh, flash drive. Uh, the contact information, telehealth, we're aggressively expanding that to the extent we have the legislative authority to do so. Uh, we're adding dialysis facilities as originating sites. Uh, we're removing some geographic requirements uh, for uh, initiating sites uh, for uh, telehealth. We're actually um, adding mobile stroke units as um, initiating sites for telehealth. And um, for diagnosis and treatment of strokes, uh, we're not applying uh, the geographic re requirements. So those can be used in urban areas as well to rapidly diagnose strokes. Um, telehealth and opioids, same thing. Patients that are um, now under uh, substance use disorder treatment, uh, they can even uh, be using uh, telehealth uh, from their home to get uh, uh, treatment. And, uh, okay, 15 minutes, good. And we're right on time. And. Uh, Virtual care, virtual care is not telehealth. It's what we call virtual check-ins. We call it communications technology. That could be a telephone. So that doctors, uh, physicians, clinicians can conduct virtual check-ins with their patients and be paid for them. If they do have a subsequent office visit, that might be bundled in, but uh, we do have that provision now where uh, clinicians can uh, bill for virtual check-ins and physicians can even take a picture of their rash or their lesion. I could rip this um, Band-Aid off my head and take a picture of my little boo-boo and send it to the doctor, which is ridiculous because I, I am an ER doc and I put a Band-Aid on it, that's it. But anyway, um, they could do that if you were worried. And uh, no, my wife did not hit me with a frying pan. <laughs> I was doing the groceries and banged my head on the uh, uh, the, the, the back of the uh, trunk of the car. And it bled a little, oh my goodness. That's why I had a Band-Aid and put it on. Anyway, I spared you this, uh, the, the horror of looking at my scratch. Uh, so it looks like I had something really bad. Anyway, quality payment program for clinicians. 
clinicians now uh, have to accept risk, either on, the, on both the upside and the downside. Under our uh, merit-based incentive payment program, physicians this year, based on their quality reporting, which includes cost and quality measures, can achieve up to a plus minus, excuse me, can achieve up to a positive 9% bonus, or they are at risk for a minus 9% takeaway from their uh, fee schedule. So there's real money uh, at play on this two-sided risk. However, if you don't want to play that two-sided risk game, there is a provision where if you join an alternative, advanced alternative payment model, such as some of the two-tailed uh, ACOs as a physician, we will give you an automatic 5% upfront bonus for participating in an advanced alternative payment model. And then you'll negotiate the rest of your bonus or upside with, with your model, but we'll give you 5% right off the top, guaranteed, if you qualify. If you don't want to play that zero-sum game, plus, plus nine, minus nine, because it's all in one pot, there are going to be winners and losers. So clearly you can see that this physicians will realize there is a significant incentive to participate in ACOs and alternative payment models going forward. And then we are streamlining our quality reporting for the merit-based incentive payment. We add four domains of quality promoting interoperability, improvement activities, and cost. Those are the domains we are scoring this year. But beginning next year, we are going to reduce the burden of reporting and uh, have a foundation of promoting interoperability and population-based measures that will be based on CMS data. Uh, practices don't have to report that. They only have to report quality improvement and cost. And down the road, we are looking on a scale of around three to five years of integrating all of those measures to include CMS uh, acquired data so that reporting is essentially automatic and reduce the burden on uh, physicians and streamline the reporting. Uh, once again, we are offering a lot of technical assistance to small practices. You'll see a lot more about interoperability tomorrow where data follows the person across all of the uh, uh, different uh, areas of care. Uh, and then, of course, we're basically, and I'm about on my next to last slide, we're looking to go from the old approach where the patient's chief complaint was the reason they came to the office to assessing the healthcare needs of all the patients at the time they present. Uh, not just looking at today's problem, what's the problem today. I do that in the ER, of course. It's like, well, what's bothering you? Well, I got the five things. Why did you come to my emergency room today? Of course, that's an ER. That's, that's what I have to do. Why did you come today? But that's not the model out there in the community where you want to be looking proactively at the entire uh, spectrum of patients' medical problems. Uh, used to be patients were responsible for coordinating their own care. And unfortunately, in my father-in-law's case, that was a virtual disaster. Uh, we need to have a team of professionals and, uh, that coordinate that uh, care. And uh, it used to be up to the patient to tell them what happened to them. Well, what happened? What did you see when you saw that other doctor? Uh, if I had a nickel for every time a patient came in and said, oh, I had a CAT scan on my head uh, two days ago. Really? That's nice. It's Saturday morning at 1 in the morning. And I can't get the result of that CAT scan. What did it show? I don't know. Guess what? You just gave me a problem. I have to get another CAT scan on you. Do you know how wrong that is? <laughs> but I had to do it. That's just one example of not coord how, how coordinated care is not a good thing. And you know, you can track the tests and consults after the ED visit. So once again, we're creating systems. We're building a learning system, a uh, health system. We're looking at alternative payment models. I've got some resources for you that uh, once again, you can put in your search engine. Uh, the, the connected care, chronic care management page that I talked about, and I'm done and I finished on time and to the extent I can provide any answers 
which is highly unlikely. I'm happy to take your questions. I will be happy to. Um, I will not speculate on the future, and I will not speculate on politics. Those are off limits. Uh, I won't do that unless you ply me with liquor in the bar tonight. <laughs> and I probably won't even do it then. In fact, I'm not staying to have drinks. So anyway, not going there. But anyway, if you have substantive questions, I'm happy to try to answer them. I'm passing the mic around. If you have a question, raise your hand. And OK, just like that. OK, I'll, I'll let someone else uh, pick out the, uh, the questioners so I don't uh, get in trouble or offend that anybody. That was a very wonderful talk. Thank you. You have covered a lot of very, very difficult areas. Thank you. Very efficiently. Very, at a very high level. Very high level. Like I'm an ER doc. I have a knowledge base that is a mile wide and an inch deep. That's right. Thank you. Um, one of the things that you talked about was the things for calendar year 2020, the transition, uh, transitional care management payment and those types of things. Do you know, so are those on the list to be addressed in 2020 or is the goal to by December of this year to have those things? Yeah, done? so, so the, the transitional care, the coordinated care uh, and the, um, uh, those are in the regulation and those are, going, those are now in effect for 2020. A couple of the things I mentioned, such as the evaluation and management codes and the Medicare value uh, pathways. The evaluation and management codes where I talked about how we're restructuring uh, those, the American Medical Association, we've adopted those, but we're not implementing them until next year, 2021. That's gonna give providers a lot of time to learn uh, this new coding system. And the va value-based, the, the Medicare MIPS pathways, we're not changing a lot in the quality payment program. Uh, the MIPS merit-based incentive payment program this year, some little tweaks, but those uh, value-based pathways, the uh, uh, MIPS value pathways, those we will start seeing beginning next year, and those will be continue to be evolve over the next several years. Yes. Up, oh, up, oh, up. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. I've got to. I've got to. I've got to follow. You raise your hand, and they'll get to you. Yes, sir. Thank you, Dr. White, uh, for your presentation. And this is uh, Mike Kong from Connect Pulse. I have one question about the innovation center you have. And, and what is, uh, what uh, for technology company, how we can access your in a, you know, resource of your, your innovation center? Yes. So if you go to the website of the innovation center, which is, I don't want to give you exact, you, innovations at CMS. If you just put, you know, innovation center, CMS in your search engine, you're going to get the Innovation Center webpage where they're going to list all about the Innovation Center, all the current uh, uh, demonstrations and innovations that their projects they're having. And there will be on that site ability to, for you to submit questions uh, to a mailbox and ask questions and also request a meeting. So on that website, there will be a place where you could request a meeting with uh, certain uh, uh, people in the Innovation Center if you had an innovation you wanted to discuss. And, and, and there is a, like I said, a mailbox and they'll say, how do I request a meeting or I want to talk about this and they'll, they'll, they'll uh, email you back. Okay. If I gave you the URLs and all the email boxes for everything, it would be, you know, 10 pages of slides, so, but it's, it's there. Uh, and just Innovation Center CMS, you'll get to the web page and you'll see towards the end how to contact, contact us. Uh, great, uh, absolute fantastic talk, so thank you very much. Thank you. The question I had is uh, around the, the new CPT codes for remote care, virtual care, where you can see, you know, there's a lot of movement in the market, uh, a lot of uh, companies are emerging built basically on, on these reimbursement codes. Uh, a couple aspects of these codes, uh, especially around the 20% copay, uh, where you've got effectively populations with, with multiple Medicare populations with, with multiple chronic conditions, as you showed on the charts. 
Do you see these co-pays as barriers for patient adoption to leverage these services? Well, uh, you know, across the entire spectrum of our healthcare system in this country, um, and I, I take it you may have been initially from a country that had a different healthcare system, maybe more integrated, maybe at universal. Yes, thank you. <laughs> Those market payment processes are embedded in, in the system. Now people that are very poor may be uh, eligible for Medicaid and Medicare, so they're dual eligibles and they won't have a copay. So if you're very poor and you have Medicaid and Medicare, you won't have a copay. Some uh, preventative services do not have a copay by statute. Then, of course, people often do buy, uh, you know, a Medicare supplement plan to cover those copays. Uh, and are copays a barrier? Of course. I mean, people are going to look at their copays, and then and and then you could say. Is that the way the system is designed? Uh, that's a whole different philosophical point of view on how market forces work in healthcare. And I'm not going to get into that today because that's, you can listen to all the political pundits on the TV if you want to hear about that. So that's the way the system is, yes. However, you know, I tell people if you're an ACO, you're an accountable care organization, you're a managed care organization. Well, you're, you may bake telehealth into your system already. You're not billing that separately. So you're talking about fee-for-service codes, obviously. But as we move towards more integrated care, if you're an ACO, I tell you, there's nothing to stop you from doing telemedicine and telehealth anywhere. For many patients, bedroom, desk, desktop, computer, or whatnot, uh, to, to their physician. You could do that now. It's only... You have to pay by, play by our rules if you want to be reimbursed fee for service, but if you can achieve better quality outcomes and reduce your costs by using telehealth, go ahead. We're not stopping anybody from doing that. So I, I think you, know, you have to look at, we are moving away from plain vanilla fee for service and more into, into these advanced payment models. So. So I think that may be the answer if, if I were to give you any free marketing strategy, which I'm not. But, <laughs> okay. All right, I think I'm going to get the hook here. Me getting up is actually just saying that it's almost, just to add something to your question, actually, that um, chronic care management models um, have been around for a long time. May 2020, CMS introduced these two codes. And um, whether you will be an AC or not, and I'm not trying to override what Dr. Weil just said, he's absolutely right about it. Copay stays with everybody. 20% copay that was actually applied to this CCM code um, is huge on patients. The reimbursement is about $60 a month. If you, talk a if you talk to a patient and say that your copay is going to be whatever, 20% of uh, $60, $12 a month, um, they are going to probably step back. Um, Getting into a risk share model and reducing that, waiving that copay, I feel that I think the good policy approach would be to have a copay to begin with, but then the monthly should not have a copay. And I think that's a good approach to begin with, but certainly there are challenges, and that is why there is less adoption in telehealth right now than others. And uh, it is going to pick up. It is going to pick up slowly and eventually, but still certainly a problem there. Yeah. So thank you very much, Dal, okay. uh, for your presentation. Thank Let's you. give a big hand of applause to Dr. Thank you.